Hey everybody, I'm Mike from Electric City Sentai Denzi Caster, and welcome to the Denzi Blitz. This is the show where we take some tokusatsu television series and go through it really quick. Um, normally on Denzi Caster, we take a show and we go through it two episodes at a time. Here on the Blitz, we go through them five or more episodes at a time, and today we are starting off our new series for the Blitz uh, here on the ECS Network, and that is Kiryu Sentai Ranger. Now, this, which is an oddity, I don't often get to do this here on, uh, the, on uh, Denzi Caster, is the DVD release stateside of Ranger. It has been released here in the United States, been out for a couple of years. This is from Shout Factory. You can still find it here in the U.S. Uh, on Amazon and elsewhere, 10-disc series. We're going to take it a disc at a time, which means this is part one of a 10-part series. Talking about the 1992 series that inspired a phenomenon. This is the show that inspired Mighty Morphin Power Rangers. No ifs, ands, or buts. Now, a little bit of background, and then we're going to talk about uh, Ranger, which... We don't go into the plot uh, overly big here on this show. It's more impressions and thoughts and things of that nature. So, real quick, some history. Haim Saban had been wanting to bring Super Sentai to the U.S. since the 80s. Uh, specifically, he wanted to originally bring a show called Bioman to the United States. Uh, Urban Legend has it that he even shot a pilot for Bioman that has never been seen. Um, the idea has always been to bring a Japanese superhero live-action series to the U.S., edit out all of the actor footage, meaning the guys not in suits, uh, shoot new footage with American actors for those spots, and then edit in the costumed Japanese fight footage. The idea was that you could uh, produce an entire season or year's worth of television for half the price because you're only having to shoot half the footage. Uh, interesting cost-saving concept. He tried it first uh, with Bioman. There are press releases and interviews uh, from the time frame where he was working on it and shooting the pilot. Um, the sort of uh, rumor and innuendo kind of thing would tell you that Jetman was pegged to be the first series um, whether that is truly the case or not, nobody is entirely certain. Uh, what we do know is that the character names for Power Rangers were around long before the pilot was ever shot. Um, the idea of Jason and Billy and Kimberly and Trini and Zack, those characters had existed for a while, um, though not all in the forms we would get them. Um, the original concept that we do know that there's a pilot out for, there is something out for, would have been called Galaxy Rangers, and it would have had our heroes uh, in the Zoo Ranger costumes by the looks of the trailer. So it was shot not too early before 1992, although it's entirely possible that it was shot with Jetman in mind and then edited into that uh, Zoo Ranger footage. But it would have had the Rangers as intergalactic police officers, basically. Um, and Mark DeCascos was the original actor, cast as Jason, the Red Ranger. Uh, and you can see him in that role in the trailer footage. Well, the ultimate end result was Jetman was not used if it was ever considered. Uh, Bioman never happened, and it would have been called Bioman here in the U.S. Uh, as well, but it didn't. And in 1993, Zhu Ranger was turned into Mighty Morphin Power Rangers. Uh, a pilot episode version of Day of the Dumpster was shot. Uh, most of the original cast was brought back for the actual Day of the Dumpster first episode shooting. Um, the only exception, Rene uh, uh, Marais, du uh, Audrey Dubois, I'll get it right in a minute, uh, Audrey Dubois, uh, was recast. She was the original Trini, and she was replaced by Twee Trang, um, the late Twee Trang, uh, who would play Trini Kwan for the remainder of Mighty Morphin. So, this show, Zhu Ranger, how is it different? 1993, we got a show about five teenagers with attitudes summoned to a high-tech base in the California desert 
by a UFO headed robot and a disembodied head and a giant floaty test tube with some lights. Um, that is giving the gross oversimplification of it. Um, and, and we loved it. We loved it in 93. We have these five spandex clad martial arts heroes uh, taking on the evil witch Rita Repulsa and all of her minions. Well, in this show, uh, we wind up with a drastically different story. Power Rangers was very science fiction based. Um, there was magic and there were witches and warlocks and things of this nature. But Rita Repulsa was an intergalactic villain. She was imprisoned in a dumpster on an asteroid in deep space for 10,000 years for the crimes she had committed against all of the universe, basically, the, not the least of which was Earth. Well, in this show, it is very Earth-bound. Um, we have our heroes, the G-Rangers, who 170 million years ago were among the tribes that coexisted with the dinosaurs in this world that uh, Bandora had attacked and terrorized and victimized. And their guardian beasts, these deities of these tribes, would come to their rescue after brutal attacks that cost the lives of many of their leaders and loved ones. And they would imprison Queen Bandora, and they would deposit her prison, which housed her and her minions, on a rogue planet called Nemesis that travels the universe in, in erratic paths. And they would imprison them there, presumably for eternity. And then, just in case Queen Bandora should somehow escape, they left one sage wizard, whose name escapes me because I'm a terrible fan, one sage wizard uh, would remain out and about as the world grew and evolved to stay as lookout. And five young warriors from these tribes would be placed in suspended animation so that should Bandora return, there will be someone on Earth that can stop her. Therein lies the beginning, the backstory of G-Ranger. When our first episode starts, Queen Bandora is released from Planet Nemesis by some unsuspecting astronauts. If you've ever seen the, ah, after 10,000 years, I'm free, if you've seen that scene from the opening credits of Mighty Morphin, you've seen the scene where Queen Bandora is released. The only difference being that there's a couple of kids in the shuttle with the astronauts, and that leads into our first couple of episodes. When Queen Bandora, and we'll start with the villains and the way they're treated and the way they look, we all know the look. It's classic. Um, the golems, her putties, uh, the golems look a little bit better and a little bit cooler because uh, there are different kinds. Instead of just the one gray-suited putty that we're used to in the U.S., we had a couple episodes with the super putties in, it, in Power Rangers, but in G-Ranger, those golems, the, the upgraded golems, are part of the regular fighting force, and they are tougher than the putties by far. But we, all, we know all these designs, and we know the way they look, and they look pretty dang cool for 1992 when you stop and think about it. Um, 1992 Super Sentai frankly didn't look that much different than 1982 Super Sentai. The production quality had improved over the years, but um, it, it was a slow, uh, a slow evolution, uh, not a technology revolution. Uh, as you might think, with 10 years of the gap of, of special effects and movie-making technology. Something made now, in 2016, uh, looks a heck of a lot different than something that was made in 2006, uh, as an example. So, you get the idea. If you took something made in 1996 U.S. television and compared it to something made in 19. 86 for U.S. television, there's a marked difference and a marked improvement. But this, it's sort of traditional stay the course, but these guys, they look pretty dang cool. Uh, Griffzor, Goldar, um, looks pretty dang awesome. Uh, he always has the wings in this version, by the way. Um, Queen Bandora, a.k.a. Rita Repulsa, um, the headaches were in the Japanese version, for anyone that was curious. It started there. Oh, I've got such a headache. But Queen Bandora is uh, 
it's a little odd to see her where the the acting matches the words entirely because it is the incomparable Machiko Soga uh, who has been a villainess of tokusatsu renowned for, at this point, decades in Japan. Um, this, I think, was the third decade uh, in which she appeared in a tokusatsu production uh, of some sort. It might have been the second. Um, I know that she was in... Uh, no, 1981 was... Uh, was Sun Vulcan, which she was one of the main villains. 1980, the year before, was Denzi Man, uh, where we may or may not got, have gotten part of our name. Um, but that she was also in as the main villain. She was in a Metal Hero show, which one off the top of my head I don't remember, as a main villain. Uh, and now, here, in G Ranger, which I think is her final appearance in Super Sentai as the bad guy. Um, but not her final appearance in Super Sentai. Much more brutal in this version, the villains are. Um, Squat and Babu, who are played straight for comic relief in the United States, uh, in Power Rangers, in this show, and I believe it's uh, Topet and... Uh, I, forget I forget what their Japanese names are off the top of my head. But the bumbling idiot monsters, uh, the sidekick monsters... In the Japanese version, they are sort of a brutal, monstrous Vulcan skull. You can almost see where the Japanese characters were split in two for the American version. That you had Vulcan skull, the bullies, um, and then you had the bumbling idiot monsters. And they kind of took the two traits and separated them and made Squat and Babu predominantly the bumbling idiots and Balkan Skull predominantly the bullies until such time as they also became the bumbling idiots. In this, those two characters are bungling idiots, but they are also malicious, malevolent bullies. So uh, taking delight in the death of small children with high explosives. Um, so not nice people, and there's no gray lines here. There is no she might be good, she might be bad type thing just yet. No, she wants to kill, she wants to take over Earth, and she hates kids. It's a kid's show. She's the heel. No questions asked. Queen Bandora, bad. And in this show, she's much more aggressive. She comes to Earth immediately before we ever have heroes. Now, talking about the heroes... These guys have apparently been buried in suspended animation under Tokyo, Japan for 170 million years. Um, hey, as far as I can tell, they're trapped in the Phantom Zone. Um, our wizard goes over and opens, with color-coded keys, five doors, or at least he tries. He gets through four of them, each of them marked with a different prehistoric creature. Uh, a mammoth, or mastodon, uh, a pterodactyl, a Triceratops, a saber-toothed tiger, and he goes to open the door for the Tyrannosaurus and the key breaks off in the lock. Um, when each of the doors open, with the exception of the Tyrannosaurus, because it doesn't open, we see this thin glass pane rotate to face the camera, and we see the ranger in it, in suspended animation, in their civilian form. Um, with some fairly interesting, presumably prehistoric, uh, royal garb, because they're all either knights or princes or princesses, some sort of nobility of their respective prehistoric tribes. Um, visually, again, very unique, and for the time frame, very different. Um, Super Sentai uh, in 1992 was just coming off a couple of fairly high-tech looking seasons, uh, Five Man and Jet Man, respectively. Well, this show went back to uh, a very fantastic look, very akin to, if you backtrack in uh, history of Super Sentai, something akin probably more to Flash Man um, than anything else. But uh, go check it out. You're on the internet. Google that stuff. You'll see the, the very interesting looking outfits. But these guys in their civilian garb, I'll hold this up a little bit because that's what's on the cover. Um, they show here the civilian garb. They didn't want to put them in their hero garb on the front cover predominantly because they didn't want to confuse it with Power Rangers here in the U.S. But if you do flip it over, there they are as the Zhu Rangers. Um, 
you have that. But um, very unique look. One of the things that we notice is that they are trained warriors. They already know how to fight. They are already a team. Far cry from five teenagers with attitudes, of which two are going to learn martial arts from the morphing grid, and they're going to learn how to use all this technology by having the knowledge implanted in their brains. These cats already know how to do all this stuff. They are here for one purpose. Stop Pandora. Period. Done. Another thing that I really enjoy about this show so far, and we've watched, I've watched the first five episodes so far, disc one, they earn everything. Um, nothing is cheapened. Um, now, it may sound like I'm talking a lot of smack about Power Rangers. I'm not. Um, I grew up on Mighty Morphin. I loved it. That's one of the reasons I'm a huge Toku fan today, was Mighty Morphin Power Rangers. But in retrospect, from a narrative standpoint, the Power Rangers had it pretty dang easy. They had a floating head and a tube that gave them whatever they needed. Um, the power weapons, the power bow, power sword, power axe, which formed the power blaster, Rangers bring them together. That was given to them by Zordon. In this show, they have their prehistoric weapons that have been with them, the lance, the bow, the axe, since 170 million years ago, but they're antiquated. They're bum weapons by the standards of 20th century Earth and by the standards of Bandora's monsters. They don't hold up. The first time they use them in battle, they break. Um, when you see them again, they're using them and they're training with them, and they break a lot. They break pretty much their entire arsenal. Um, they wind up heading to the Land of Despair, which in Power Rangers is the Island of Illusion and comes much later in the series. Here it's episodes three and four. They go to this island that causes great emotional distress, uh, d distress rather, the longer you're there. And if you're there for 24 hours, you will turn to stone. Um, but the reward, if you can pull it off, is these legendary weapons. Um, weapons that visually look very much like the prehistoric weapons they have, but when they transform, the weapons will transform with them, and they become the iconic weapons we all know and love from Power Rangers. They have to earn them. You don't just get them. Um, the Guardian Beasts, the Zords here in the U.S., in the, the Power Rangers, they are just robots. They're fighting machines, nothing more, nothing less. In G-Ranger, they are deities to these tribes. They are mythical, intelligent beasts that... Uh, guide the rangers in many ways and ally with the rangers. They are not weapons in their arsenal. They are allies in battle who, should they choose to go on their own separate way, they're going to. Uh, in fact, in the episodes with the Land of Despair, when they're going after the legendary weapons, the Guardian Beasts will not help them. They basically say, no, you earn them. They're your weapons. Prove yourself worthy of them. Um, so they have to earn all of their everything, essentially. Um, another very interesting thing. The trailer for episode six shows what we would know to as know as the Megazord in tank mode. In this show, the Dino Tank. We still have not seen this guy. Dai Zujin, as he is called in uh, G Ranger, the Megazord in the United States uh, Power Rangers version. Still haven't seen him. Think about that for a second, from a narrative standpoint, as I try not to break the toy. The Power Rangers version of this, you see pretty dang quick. And it's a toy commercial, even in Japan. One of your biggest toys, you've left off the show for at least six episodes. That's a pretty big deal by today's standards, but... Uh, but it's proof at the time that while it was a commercial, they had a story to serve and they were going to serve it. So I appreciate that a lot. Um, if I'm knocking anything about these first few episodes, it is this. The music is uh, pretty much atrocious. Um, the opening and closing themes of G-Ranger are far from my favorite. Uh, terrible would be the word I would use. 
Um, the opening theme is sung by the actor that played Red Turbo in Turbo Ranger. He also sung, sang the opening theme for Turbo Ranger as well. Again, his name escapes me at the moment. Um, but um, it's, it's a terrible theme, in my humble opinion. I don't like it. Um, but it was very much um, bog standard for the time of this uh, very majestic uh, or majestic sounding theme that would be slow and, and I prefer the high energy type theme and you get the high energy insert songs in the series but Kong Spade a Spade, Go Go Power Rangers is a hell of a lot better theme than the G Ranger theme, just saying. So, we're five episodes in, that means we got 45 to go, nine more installments of this. So we're going to uh, kick back, relax, and watch more of Zhu Ranger as the weeks go by. Just a couple of quick things. Remember, of course, Denzi Caster where it regularly airs here on the channel. Uh, so definitely check that out in the off weeks from Denzi Blitz. Also, check out our Cafe Press store if you get a chance. If you want to help out the ECS network, you want to help out Denzi Caster, go check out our store. It's cafepress.com slash ECS network. You can find all of uh, our shows represented there, and you can find yourself some pretty sweet Denzi Caster swag. Uh, we have the do you, you know, do you Show Bro. We have the uh, Department of Special Investigations shirt, uh, a.k.a. the Basement Dwelling Fools, and a few others. So uh, check that out and uh, get a chance, you know, support our friendly local uh local to wherever your computer is your friendly uh podcast video show about tokusatsu so now that i've slowed down what is supposed to otherwise be a fairly quick show until next time i'm mike share like subscribe do all those wonderful things that you do here on youtube you get a chance check us out on facebook too facebook.com slash denzycaster until next time when we have more of Ranger. I'm Mike, and we'll see you on the blitz.